Blake Smithson. I'm a middle school teacher and resident of Fett County in southern West Virginia. Last summer, I was fortunately selected to participate in an Appalachian Studies program sponsored by the National Endowment for the Humanities, directed by Dr. Sylvia Sherbet from Shepherd University. While I was searching for a topic to develop into my culminating project, I discovered a collection of 20 poems written in 1938 by a scholar, award-winning poet, professor, and social activist, Muriel Rukeyser. Her writings, titled The Book of the Dead, bring to witness the events of the Hawk's Nest Industrial Tragedy, which took place in and around Golly Bridge, West Virginia, during the height of the Great Depression. Having lived most of my life in Fed County, the story of the Hawk's Nest disaster was only vaguely familiar to me, unrecognizable as a distant relative, without a connection to my own experience. Resonating from her poetry were the voices of its victims wasted away by a choking lung disease, slowly suffocating to death, calling out from her poems. Hundreds and hundreds of men, possibly even thousands of nameless victims, were buried in unmarked graves under an empty cornfield. Their records were deliberately destroyed. According to the leading scholar, on the subject, Dr. Martin Chernak, more people died during the drilling of the Hawk's Nest Tunnel than the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire, the Sunshine Mine Disaster, and the Farmington Mine Disaster combined. The Akali Bridge is almost forgotten. The objective for my presentation today is to represent what would be the creation of a dramatic play or a performance work which would bring to life voices from Rukeyser's beautifully written poems about the Hawk's Nest industrial disaster. I grew up just miles from this historic site, yet the tunnel disaster has been hidden and suppressed for two generations by those with a vested financial interest, as well as an unwillingness on the part of the citizens and government of West Virginia to admit our own failures in the matter. Here is the story of those who stood as witness to the events as told by Muriel Rukasser. Sounds not loud enough. River is the oldest river in North America, flowing north from the mountains of North Carolina until it meets the Golly River to form the Canal River near the town of Golly Bridge. Above the great New River Gorge, located in Fayette County, the flow of the New River is a thousand feet wide, narrowing dramatically once it reaches the interior of the gorge to just a few hundred feet wide in places. The rushing waters descend an average of 30 feet per mile in the section of the river just above Hawk's Nest. Today, this area is, and its surrounding rapids have become the home of West Virginia's whitewater rafting industry. In 1936, writer, poet, social, and political activist Muriel Rukeyser traveled to Golly Bridge, West Virginia intending to make a documentary film to expose the tragedy of the Hawks Nest Industrial Disaster. Along with photographer and friend Nancy Nomberg, she interviewed survivors, workers, and families of the victims. Her investigation later resulted in the collection of 20 poems, which first appeared in her book, titled US One, published in 1938. Beginning as 
early as 1924, the Union Carbide and Carbon Corporation, a dominant force for economic development in the region, began to acquire land titles to key sections of the river bottoms and adjacent lands. To exploit the tremendous potential of the new river, Union Carbide created a wholly owned subsidiary for the production of cheap and efficient hydroelectric power, supposedly formed as a public utility. In March 1930, Union Carbide granted the tunnel contract to the firm Reinhardt and Dennis of Charlottesville, Virginia. That company had over 30 years of experience constructing power stations, railroad tunnels, and dams. The plans for this engineering marvel, constructed during the era of the New Deal, would include a tunnel to be drilled through Gauley Mountain, diverting the public waters in the New River. The tunnel itself would be more than three miles long, up to 42 feet in diameter, with a 162-foot drop. The completion deadline, 24 months, was required by the contract with financial penalties for overruns. Core samples taken by Union Carbide before construction began had revealed almost 100% pure silica along the route through the mountain sandstone. Following the discovery, the tunnel was enlarged by engineers at strategic points along the route and what eventually became a mining operation to extract valuable silica used in the production of electro-metallurgical products. Exposure to silica was known to cause lung disease and result in eventual death. The tunnel drilling was completed in a record pace of only 17 months. Because of such extreme working conditions, breathing almost pure silica, most workers began to die in a matter of weeks. By some estimates, the number of victims exceeded 700 souls. Predominantly Southern black migrant workers hired during the peak of the Great Depression. Of the workforce hired by the general contractor, approximately 65% were African Americans, mostly from Virginia and the Carolinas. Reports of the tragedy were largely ignored and unreported by mainstream press due to its geographic isolation and the suppression of evidence controlled by Union Carbide and its general contractor, Reinhardt and Dennis. The Book of the Dead captures the voices of its victims, first-person accounts of the working conditions inside the tunnel, records, testimony given in two civil trials, and evidence presented in testimony before the U.S. House of Representatives in Washington, D.C. Muriel Brookheiser's poems on the subject include such titles as Golly Bridge, The Face of the Dam, The Disease, West Virginia, George Robinson Blues, and Power. The Book of the Dead. The events of the play would take place between the years of 1931 and 1935 in and around Golly Bridge, including the Robinson, Negro worker, Miss Philippa Allen, social worker from New York, Mr. Hadley White, local undertaker from Nicholas County, Mrs. Raymond Johnson, mother of three sons, lost to silicosis, Merle Blankenship, a lingering victim, Dr. Leroy Harless, local physician, former company doctor, Senator Vito Marcantonio, Republican from New York, freshman Senator Jennings Randolph, Virginia, 
plaintiff's attorneys, various shucksters, pay 50% of awards. Corporate defense attorneys, skilled shysters with plenty of resources. The narrator's role will be to set the tone for the story, guiding the audience throughout the play, preparing us to hear the suffering of the victims, the evidence of their petitions, and their cries for justice. The characters of George Robinson and Merle Blankenship are representative of the many victims of the tragedy. Golly Bridge is a good town for Negroes. They let us stand around. They let us stand around the sidewalks if we're black or brown. Over the trestle, that's our town, Banana. Did you ever bury 35 men in the back of your house? 35 tunnel workers the doctors didn't attend died in the tunnel camps. There are rocks everywhere. World without end. When a man said, I feel poorly for any reason, any weakness or such, letting up when he couldn't barely keep going, the cap and the company come and run him off the job, surely. When the blast went off, the boss would come and call out, come, let's go back, tell us, hurry, hurry, into the fallen rock and muck. Looked like somebody sprinkled flour all over us. Stayed in the rain, couldn't wash it away. And it twinkled that white dust look pretty down around our ankles. Dark as I am, when I came out at morning after the tunnel at night, with a white man, nobody could have told which man was white. I wake up choking, and my wife rolls me over on my left side. Then I'm asleep. Dream I always see, the tunnel would choke, the dark wall covered in dust. I've written a letter. Dear sir, my name is Merle Blankenship, and I have worked for the Reinhardt and Dennis Company many days and many nights, and it was so dusty you couldn't hardly see the lights. I've sued the company twice, but when the lawyers got a settlement, they didn't want to talk to me. I'm a married man have a family. God knows if they can do anything for me. It would be appreciated if you can do anything for me. Let me know soon. My youngest was 18 when he died. At first they called it tunnelitis. I lost three sons that worked in the tunnel. Shirley was my youngest. He worked inside about 18 months. Tried to get Dr. Harless to x-ray the boys, but he would not see Shirley. He didn't know where the money would come from. So I went on the road and begged the x-ray money. My son's case was the first of the lawsuits. They sent the lawyers down and the doctors down. They shut off the electric in the camps. Vanetta, Glenn Ferris, Alloy, Golly Bridge, the whole valley is witness. Other important roles will be Dr. Harless, the company doctor, who presents testimony of the medical evidence, having examined more than 300 tunnel, tunnel workers. And social worker Philippa Allen from New York, who will testify before Congress, having spent four summers in Golly Bridge interviewing victims. Almost as soon as work was begun in the tunnel camps, men began to die among dry drills. No masks. After the work, the camps were closed or burned. The ambulance was going day and night. White's undertaking business thriving, and his mother's cornfield put to a new use. Burials were carried out in great haste with no medical evaluation. Bodies were stuffed into canvas bags and buried in an unidentified field distant from Golly Bridge. 
I knew a man who died at four in the morning at camp. At seven, his wife took clothes to dress the dead husband, and the undertaker told her the husband was already buried. Miss Allen, how much time have you spent in West Virginia? During the summers of 1934 and 35, I was doing social work down there. I first heard of the Gauley Tunnel tragedy, which evolves around 2008. Have you met these people personally? I've talked to people, yes. The drilling took about two years. The rock through which they were boring was of high silica content. It ran 97 to 99% pure silica. In fact, didn't the company enlarge the size of the tunnel due to the fact that they discovered silica? This is true. The company must have known the danger for men. They neglected to provide the workmen with any safety device. Congress began its investigations in 1935. The tunnel was already complete. The hydroelectric dam was already built. House of Representatives committee members, Vito Marcantonio, Republican from New York, read into the hearing record the following statement referring to West Virginia's workers' compensation statute. Whether or not the West Virginia workers' compensation silicosis law is declared unconstitutional, the subservience of the West Virginia legislature to the interests of employers is almost unparalleled in its hypocrisy. The statute must be wiped out. The subcommittee had no power to subpoena company officials or executives for testimony from either Reinhardt and Dennis or executives of UU Carbine. Local attorneys representing the plaintiffs filed 336 separate lawsuits against the general contractor, effectively clogging the court system of Fayette County at the time West Virginia's workers' compensation laws did not cover claims for silicosis. By the end, 1933, the general contractor, Reinhardt and Dennis, reached out a court settlement with 17 local attorneys. The outstanding claims on behalf of plaintiffs amounted to $4 million. A settlement of all claims against the contractor was reached for the sum of $130,000, of which half to go to the attorneys in agreement for them not to further prosecute with the crucial requirement that all medical evidence be surrendered to the defense. In 1936, congressional hearings were called to investigate the conditions, but without the power to subpoena witnesses, little new information could be gathered during the investigation. A request to continue funding the efforts of the committee was blocked by the House of Representatives effectively ending the investigation and, ed and any further public outcry. Neither company was ever held responsible under the law for the suffering. 